Go ahead and talk about this. A lot of this is just, you know, basic material. Review the basis of the EEG to discuss the fre frequency components of the EEG. So classically, people talk about, you know, the different frequency bands, delta, theta, alpha, beta, whatever. Uh, we tend to think more about spectral analysis, uh, computer analysis of the EEG, because it, it, we're not too much interested, except how it relates to depth of anesthesia, about traditional EEG frequency bands. We're more interested in what changes are occurring with respect to the operation. So I, I want to spend a couple minutes on that. Again, some information on the effects of, the, of anesthesia on EEG because that's important. And then the effects of ischemia and hypothermia on EEG because those are the, the three big things you, you see in the operating room are the effects of anesthesia, then the effects of ischemia, named, you know, from either how a tumor is pushing against arteries or if an embolus is thrown, whether it's, we were just talking about an air emboli, air embolus, or if it's a, a, a particle other than air, those are produce ischemic effects. And then hypothermia is um, a, another big effect on EEG. So it's good to have in your mind a picture of how the body temperature affects the EEG because you'll, you'll see that in the operating room. Surgeons will want the temperature lowered for some reason, and, and uh, those are things you've got. So we're, we're kind of focused on the things that are pertinent to the operating room rather than the general universe. Um, again, we, we've talked about this, and I, I, I want to I keep going back to this because I think it's, it's in terms of understanding what's going on. What's happening in the EEG, it's, it's very important to have clear in your mind what the EEG represents, namely the summed synaptic activity. So there's, there's no mystery about it. It's, you know, it's, it's, at the end of the day, the EEG is an epiphenomenon, namely it's something based on something. The thing it's based on is all this summed synaptic activity. And that's why, uh, these different factors come into play. Why uh, anesthetics affect it? Because they affect the synaptic junctions in some way. That's why ischemia affects it. Because you know the blood, the sodium potassium pump takes two thirds of the energy in the brain. The energy is the ox comes from the oxygen. You know it's very rapidly demonstrable in the operating room that you get these very rapid changes. So just to reiterate what we've talked about, I'm not going to dwell on this. Everybody's probably mm -hmm. sick and tired of me talking about it. Uh, so that's the key. The electrical concepts, again, you got you to have these in your mind. You know, what is the BEGs of voltage? you got to measure between two points. The points you pick and we call it the montage, the points you pick will determine what you're going to see. So in the operating room, you're going to think about how you define that montage a little differently than the way you would in a diagnostic laboratory. Okay. So uh, again, things we've gone through, but just to drive home the point, I cannot overemphasize enough the importance of having these very basic ideas clear in your mind because they will make it easier for you as you work through problems. Uh, neurons are electrical. We beat that into the ground. Everybody believes that. Um, and then the summed effect of the ex ex EPSPs and IPSPs on the pyramidal neurons just key concept, you know, the, the, and uh, we talk, you know, on the cortex, we talk about the EEG when, when we record, I mean, on the scalp, it's the EEG, on the cortex, it's the, it's the choreogram, 
and when you get down into the brain tissue, you get what are called local field potentials, LFPs. Um, but the, the key idea for us is synchronous excitation or inhibition of large numbers of pyramidal neurons. So that tells you a couple things. I mean, there may be small punctate things that occur that you won't see. You know, at the current time, the, the technology isn't sensitive enough, sensitive enough. So you could have, you know, if you think of the, of the number we talked about, 50,000 pyramidal neurons with 100,000 synapses per pyramidal neuron, uh, 50,000 of those neurons have to be synchronously excited to produce enough activity to be detected on the scalp. So uh, you, could, you could start to imagine that you can easily not see something that's, that's very punctate. But the solution around that, of course, is high density EEG recordings. And you're not gonna do that in the operating room. You know, you got, you've gotta decide what are you trying to help. You're trying to avoid the big problems, not the little problems. So, um, again, core key ideas we've got to have somehow in our mind. Um, just to re-emphasize, we introduced the idea of the current dipole. In our EEG generators, so we have these pyramidal neurons. They're aligned perpendicular to the surface and they generate these dipoles, and, and what we're sensing are the effects of those dipoles. Uh, and just to reiterate that. So, um, we've a bit talked about it, so let's go to start to talk about the EEG and what happens in the operating room. Uh, so it's a measure of electrical activity between two different locations. And, and everybody understands this, but people also don't understand it. You know, they don't, they don't, they don't take that idea and say, okay, what I'm going to see when I look at an EEG channel, which is recording between two locations, it's the difference between the activities happening at those two locations. And so the, you know, we say the words, but we don't really think about what they mean. And it's important to have very clear in your mind that it's, it's a difference between activity at two locations. Um, and, and we display it as a waveform in varying frequency. So we talked about hertz, cycles per second, and amplitude. Now, there's a standard nomenclature, everybody knows it, about the shapes. And, you know, if you're doing an EEG report, you say the patient had, you know, generalized delta wave activity or blah, 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 amplitude, blah, blah, blah. And so that, that fits the diagnostic necessity. We're interested in looking at, again, basic concepts are the same, but looking at it from a slightly different way. Okay, so so just to review the, the basic waves, alpha waves, 8 to 13 hertz, um, seen in all age groups, most common in adults, they're bilateral, uh, posterior head regions dis disappear with uh, closed, closed eyes. Uh, abnormal excitation in alpha coma, most often caused by hypoxic, by hypoxic events. So, uh, you'll see alpha wave activity in the operating room, uh, and, and many times you'll see with very stable anesthesia, you'll see nice, nice alpha wave. Um, beta waves observed again in all age groups, they tend to be small, usually symmetric, and uh, you, they're affected by the benzodiazepines that enhance the amount of, of beta wave activity. 
Theta waves, they're seen in sleep at any age. They're typically abnormal in the awake adults. And along with the delta waves, they're called slow waves. And you'll see a lot of, th of things in, in the operating room which cause shifts in the theta and delta bands. Uh, and uh, typically, in examples I'll show you, there, we kind of treat them the same. We just think of them as slow wave activity. In the delta wave, same kind of idea, idea normally seen in deep sleep in adults. It's abnormal in waking adults, seen in deep sleep in infants and children. Again, also known as a slow wave. And for the level we work at, we just think of it as a slow wave. And they have the largest amplitudes in 0.5 to 4 hertz. So, uh, you know, this is uh, in the operating room, we tend to look at the data, the EEG data, both as EEG, so the raw waveform, and we tend to also look at the, the spectral analysis of it at the same time. So we look at uh, BEG, and then we look at detailed spectral analysis, because you can see things uh, sometimes sooner in the spectral analysis than you can see in the raw signal, sometimes you can see it sooner in the raw signal than you can in the spectral analysis. It's just two different ways of looking at the same data. So the idea of spectral analysis is frequency domain analysis. And it's based on a theorem in mathematics called the Fourier theorem, which basically says that any complicated waveform which repeats uh, and uh, that's the assumption. The idea of, re of repeats is um, kind of a weak assumption because you can you can assume that the waveform is infinitely long and it doesn't repeat till after infinity. So it's a mathematical assumption. Um, it can be represented by the a sum of sines and cosines, and we don't have to worry about what the sines and cosines are so much is the fact that you can take anything, any signal, and you can decompose it into sines and cosines, which are a function of frequency. So you can, therefore, define the nature of a signal in terms of its fundamental frequency components. Does this make sense? Uh, the um, uh, other assumption, which I don't have up there, which is important, again, is this idea of non-stationarity. That you don't really want the signal to be changing in its fundamental properties. So what we'll do is we compute these transforms across very short epochs of data. So you look at data which is a, maybe a second long or half a second long to compute the transform on it. And that's called a short-term Fourier transform. So you'll see this. I don't know if, if the systems you have can do this or not, uh, uh, but you'll see it in the literature. And, and if you can do it, if you have it, I'd recommend that you use it. Um, so the idea is if you have a certain frequency, you can see this is a slow frequency. Remember we talked about the period, and for a slow frequency, the period is long. So this is the transform of that slow frequency. So this axis is frequency, this axis is time, this is amplitude, this is amplitude. The transform of this frequency into the what we call the frequency domain is a single spike, and it peaks at whatever that frequency is. This is a faster frequency, and you can see its peak is a little further out in the frequency domain. Faster yet, a little further out in the frequency domain. So uh, what we would classically describe from an electrocephalographic viewpoint in the diagnostic lab, we would say, you know, maybe a, a delta wave, um, predominantly slow wave background, 
intermixed with a delta wave activity or a theta wave activity or alpha wave activity. And you try to describe how these frequency components are mixed together. Here you have a pictorial representation. So here's a, a wave which is composed of a bunch of these waves. And you can see there's three of these waves added together to give us this thing. And it shows you exactly what the peaks are. So it's, it's a useful way of looking at the data from the EEG rapidly in the operating room. Now, then you say to yourself, well, if I can do that, I can also use that to figure out artifacts. So um, sometimes you'll have an artifact and you don't know what it is. You know? So you can do the same thing. You can compute the um, Fourier transform of that evoked potential. And the artifact may show up as a 50 hertz peak. And so you know, uh, aha, it's, it's something causing, you know, it's a warmer or something that's causing this 50 hertz to contaminate the signal. So it's a tool, you know, I, I can't emphasize enough how useful this can be to you if you can, can do it. Uh, it's not necessary, but it makes it easier to interpret data. So we've kind of talked about this normal EEG. You get an example of it. Okay, the factors we, I, I want to emphasize these again because for our world, these are real things. You know, anesthesia, extremely important that you have stable anesthesia. Uh, if you're going to clip an aneurysm, uh, you want to have that, you know, everybody to be happy where they're at before the surgeon goes to clip the aneurysm because you don't want, uh, say, uh, anesthesiologist deciding he needs to blow us a, a propofol or something just at the time the surgeon goes to put the clip on because the results of occluding the artery with the clip are the same as the results of, of uh, a massive bolus of propofol. The only thing that distinguishes the two is typically, but not always, the effect of the clip is localized while the bolus is more generalized. But sometimes Clipping and, and uh, you know accidentally occluding an art an artery can cause a global ischemic change. So uh, depending on the condition of the patient, so anesthesia is important. Blood pressure is important. Uh, CO two is important. Hypothermia is important, and hypoxia is important. So these are the things that we worry about. We're not we're not worried about trying to make um, diagnoses of different conditions so much as what are these these factors and how are they affecting us. Um, I like this figure because uh, it summarizes the EEG and anesthesia. This is one of Todd Stone's figures. Actually it was from Mark Stecker originally. Um, so you can get an EEG fastening. I don't know, some strange word. The EEG's frequencies can increase and so you have a reduced alpha rhythm and beta rhythms appear. As the, as the patient gets deeper, you can get a progressive EEG synchronizing and slowing. So you get down to the state and delta band. Um, and then deeper, you start to get into burst suppression. And then if you're really deep, you get to electrocerebral silence. Um, again, this stuff's in the notes. So you, know, you can look at it. Um, so here you're in burst suppression, here you're silent. Here you're kind of moving, starting to move into burst suppression. And, and here you're going through this transition of frequencies. So um, you can tell pretty well looking at the EEG uh, what the patient's um, depth of anesthesia is. And there's many times you want to be down here. I mean, there are um, operations where the patient, you want the patient to be very suppressed because it implies that there's less metabolic demand in the brain. And so uh, 
you know, if you're if you're going to have the patient, uh, if you're going to uh, clip an aneurysm and and uh, you're worried about um, an ischemic event secondary to placing the script, the the clip you may want to have the patient in burst suppression. So there's a debate about that. So this this table again, which is in the in the notes, and I put it together to try and there's a lot of stuff on that table, and I don't think it's worthwhile going through the detail of it today, but it is worthwhile for you to look at. Um, and what I've done is I've put the drugs down here, the effect on the frequency band here, the effect on the amplitude. So thinking about you know we've got two measures. <coughs> On the EEG, we've got its amplitude and we have its frequency. So we I tried to break out in terms of frequency and in terms of amplitude what the effects of each of these drugs were and then what it took to get you into burst suppression. So uh, let's take sevoflurane, for example. Uh, Subanesthetic, you can have some loss of alpha. Uh, really no effect on amplitude. Um, you know, anesthetic, you, you can get uh, uh, 4 to 11 hertz activity, so you'll see that, you'll see a nice uh, something which is almost alpha, a uh, little, little faster than theta, and it'll be real song. And again, no, no effect on amplitude. And then you get down to high doses, Doses greater than one and a half mat, which typically is is, is a, a high anesthetic dose, and uh, you'll get uh, slow wave activity. It will develop. You'll get the amplitude will come down, and you can get in first suppression. So this is a uh, this table's in the notes that are on your computer stick you got, uh, and it's worthwhile thinking about. It. Um, kind of, you know, nitrous oxide, what it does, what the barbiturates do, atomidate, what it, what atomidate does, propofol, uh, ketamine, uh, the benzodiazepines, and the op opioids. So, it, again, it, this is kind of trying to make a, a, a general statement which is useful, but may differ in a particular patient. So, I can't emphasize that. This to me is probably, in this section on the EEG, is probably the best thing to print out somewhere and look at. Because uh, it'll, it'll uh, turn out to be useful. So again, going back to the idea of real-time EEG, we're using it in a different way than you use it in the diagnostic lab. So we're using it, you know, in the diagnostic lab, you're trying to make decisions about diagnoses. You're trying to help provide some information which can separate one disease from another. Here we're trying to, you know, help with the operation or make, help provide information about what's happening. So it's it's a more real-time um, look at what's going on. So discontinuous or burst suppressed EEG, that can help with understanding the depth of anesthesia. Um, many times you, you want to be in burst suppression, but many times you don't want to be. And so if you, if you have your EEG going and you see you're in burst suppression and you're trying to record function in the spinal cord, you may want to, to discuss with anesthesia, decreasing whatever the primary anesthetic they're using to get you out of burst suppression. Because being in burst suppression not only affects the EGs, but it does affect the evoked potentials. It will uh, change their response amplitude. It can start to modify their shapes. Uh, so this can be an important tool in helping uh, to, to guide you through that. And, and you can get into a situation 
uh, with depth of anesthesia where you know if you get to really strong burst suppression, let's say it's like 80% burst suppressed, you may not be able to see any of all potentials either. And you may not be able to get anything. So uh, there's, a, there's always a trade-off there that you've got to work to achieve. And, and the EEG is a useful tool in terms of helping you get to that point. Uh, Sure. I don't think we're skipping anything. I think it's just uh, so relationship to ischemia. This is really, really an interesting question. Um, so mean normal cerebral blood flow is approximately 50 milliliters per hundred grams per minute of brain tissue. So uh, that's that's the number of what the, the mean blood flow is that's typical. Uh, and so that's what's required to support your normal metabolic demand. So mild hypoperfusion uh, is well tolerated. So you go down, you can go down to 40 milliliters. I'm just, you know, the numbers are not exact, but that range. You can go down to 40 milliliters per 100 grams per minute. You probably won't see any change in any of your activity. But if you get down into this area here, uh, you will 20 milliliters per 100 grams per minute. You will see really significant changes in both the EEG and the evoked potential. And we'll, I'll show you some data about that. And if if you're if you're involved in say a carotid endarterectomy uh, or again a clipping of an aneurysm um, and you see changes in the evoked potentials and the EEGs, you can pretty well assume you're down in this region. Okay, um, you know, and, and 20 to 15. Um, and when you get be, when you start to get absolute flat, flattening, you're below this number. So what does that say? Uh, it, it tells the surgeon, it tells you and it tells the surgeon several things. One is, if, if you're seeing this de decrease in amplitude, it doesn't mean he's got to do something instantaneously. It means that He's, he's working in a region where the brain is being perfused with <coughs> enough blood where the, the brain will probably survive okay for a certain period of time. So there's a time window connected with this. Nobody knows exactly what it is. But when you see changes which indicate you're down in this region, you may have 20 minutes or half an hour before you really start to worry. So, the surgeon needs to be aware of this, that these changes have occurred, but he doesn't need to, the operative team doesn't need to be panicking. And many time, these times these changes can be corrected with increasing the blood pressure, the mean blood pressure. So when you get down into this area where everything has flattened, again, uh, it's a stronger message to you, stronger message to the surgeon. Instead of having 20 minutes to fix whatever he's doing, he may have a minute or two, three. So he's got some, the message to him and the message to the team has to be, you've got some short window of time. You're, you're very seldom ever going to produce a stroke from a, a, a total decrease in responses within a few seconds. And, and there's, there's exceptions to that. There are, if you throw an emboli or something, that's a whole different problem. But in general, with the hypoperfusion, you have the ability to work across time. So, and it, and it becomes a judgment factor. There are, no, there are no hard numbers because we don't, in a given patient, 
you know, we think the patients live around here. Uh, when you see these changes in the vote potentials and the EEGs, we think they're about here, but we don't know for sure where they're at, you know, because there's no way to do those measurements. And uh, so the, this is an inferential thing, but, but people know from experience that, you know, if you've, if you've lost X percentage of the EEG, you probably have half an hour you can work. If, if you're flat, you probably have a minute or two that you can, you can work. So it's extremely useful, uh, but again, it's, it's guidelines. So just to kind of describe what uh, these things do, CBS decreased cerebral blood flow, decreased gives rise to EG changes, one attenuation, so you see that amplitude go down slowly, You'll go down into, you, you may be in the, in the um, alpha or beta range and you'll, you'll drift down into theta and delta. And I'll show you some examples with the raw EG and the spectra where you can see that happen. So this decrease indicates functional cerebral blood flow threshold has been reached. So again, not a hard number. It's a concept that you've got to then work with the surgeon to make sure he's aware of it and he can plan what he has to do to finish what he had to do that got him there in the first place. Um, and and I, like I say, it, it, which appears before the appearance of irreversible brain injury. So, uh, except in a few isolated instances mostly related to throwing emboli. And even in those ca cases, we published a paper on um, an embolus that was thrown. We figured out it was an embolus. They did a CT angiogram in the operating room and they fused, uh, I think it was urokinase at that time, into selectively where the embolus was and the patient woke up fine, everything came back. But, you're not going to do that everywhere, it just happened. Everything was in a situation where, where we could do that. But the data was, you know, the same. So these are uh, some, again, I'm, they don't project as well as I wish they did. Uh, but this gives you an idea uh, of what it looks like. Uh, so there's two different kinds of data that I, I've put here. This is the raw EEG and its spectrum. So each of these traces here is the raw EEG. These traces at the bottom are, are baseline traces. So sometimes we'll put a, you know, what it was like at the beginning. Uh, and you can see this is time. Uh, and you can see the waveform activity. Uh, these are the times at which the data was collected. And these are, uh, I think they're collected, these are four second epics. Yeah, so these are four second, it's four seconds of data and continuous, so it's continuous EEG. Now, we like to look at it in these waterfall displays rather than continuous, because we're more interested in what's happening in selected channels across time. And when you're looking at the continuous EEG, it's very hard to um, it's very hard to go from here to here in time for me, um, and so we we tend to work in these waterfalls. So this is one side of the head. This is the other side of the head, and this is the spectrum. So this is this frequency domain analysis we were talking about. These are frequencies, and I think that was. So this is zero hertz, this is 40 hertz out here. Again, um, time going in this direction. And you can see this spectra has a particular shape. So over on this side, everybody can tell me something happened. Uh, you, know, I, you know, you just look at the data and you know something happened. Uh, and so here's what the data looked like before uh, the artery was occluded clamped, so for some reason they were clamping the artery. 
uh, and put the clamp on and you can see how rapidly uh, the spectral quality changed and how rapidly the raw EEG changed. So, and you can see here, remember this is 0 to 40 hertz, so this is about alpha wave activity, these peaks out here, and you can see they just went away and got stuffed down in these lower frequency bands, which is probably in this case predominantly delta, and you can see there's an underlying delta wave activity. So that, that represents the seclusive phenomenon. Uh, the other thing I want to point out about, about this kind of display is we've got a raw, a raw EEG, and then we've got the spectra for that EEG. So uh, a lot of the times what we'll do is we'll plot the spectra more densely. You know, so and we call this a compressed spectral array. So uh, you'll have the, the raw data in one window and the spectra, compressed spectral array in another window. In the raw data, you may have 10 or 12 traces or 20 traces in the window, so you can see the detail. But the, the compressed spectral array may have 50 or 60 spectra. So it gives you a very good appreciation for when changes start to occur. So, and then if we're doing that, we, we define another parameter <coughs> called the spectral edge, which is just where 95% of the energy is. You know, we talked about energy was a function of amplitude. So, uh, so you can see here in this, in this spectral representation, got occluded, the artery was occluded, and you can see how rapidly this fell off. And here the occlusion was removed, and you can see how rapidly it came back. So uh, this is very useful information. It, it, it's uh, different than the way, you know, if you work, if you're trained as an electroencephalographer, this is heresy to you, probably. Um, but it, it lends itself to how we try to think about things in the operating room, which is a different universe. So these are good measures of what happens with hypoxia or ischemia. So EEG and hypothermia, uh, we're involved in a reasonable number of cases which involve hypothermia. Uh, and so you've got to kind of appreciate um, uh, what the hypothermia is doing to the EEG. And so I tried to lay that out here. Um, and it really progresses through a uh, um, series of predictable changes in this, you know, some more, uh, you get some good figures. Generalized progressive decrease in amplitude. You get periodic complexes. I'll show you what they look like. You get burst suppression and then you get the electrocerebral silence. So you see that whole range of things we talked about uh, uh, in, with hypothermia. Uh, so this is the effect of, this is basically pre-cooling, normal EEG. You start to cool, you get these periodic complexes. They look like uh, spiking activity. Um, this is roughly in the range of about uh, 30, say the average uh, temperature at which this may occur is uh, about 30, 30 degrees centigrade. Uh, as you continue to cool, you'll get into burst suppression. You're down at about 20, 26 degrees, probably 24, 25, somewhere there. And then you get down to electrocerebral silence at about, uh, and this data looks like it's about 16, 18 degrees centigrade. So this kind of progression occurs, and it, and it occurs roughly the same way in every patient. Uh, again, the numbers aren't hard and fast. These are you know, statistical distributions of the patients that Mark looked at, so you can see that. Some people will go into electrosilence at, at, this guy was at uh, 
30, 28 degrees. This guy took, he had to get down below 10 degrees to get to uh, electrocyte. So, um, yeah, you just got to be aware of that. Uh, don't be surprised. Uh, and, and don't be surprised in the variation of the, of the effect. Um, so again, going back to the effect of EEG anesthesia and hypothermia, uh, and they, have, they really affect the brain the same way. Both anesthesia and hypothermia influence brain function, and, and it's very hard to distinguish the two. Um, both of them induce progressive bilateral symmetric alterations in the EEGs and SEPs. So, um, uh, you know, luckily they're, they're incidental. You know, you know when you're going into hypothermia, you know what anesthesia is doing. So you differentiate between what's happening based on what the situation is, not, not anything else. Um, the, uh, but it, but it's, it's a nice, it's, it's interesting to look and see the, the similarities in the patterns when you think about the data. <clears throat> limitations of EEGs, and they have a lot. Uh, everything's got limitations. So we can't distinguish a, CB, a cerebral blood flow decrease due to hemodynamic disturbances and MOI. So it's very hard to do that. In the case I described, we just accidentally had set up things differently than the way we normally do it. Uh, it had some additional electrodes because I was playing around with something. And the only thing I was convinced that could have caused the change was MOI. But in general, you cannot distinguish a cross clamp phenomenon, which is causing a hemodynamic disturbance from throwing an embolus, which is blocking off an artery. So that is a limitation, and, and people have to somehow factor that into their, their thinking about what the data is telling them. Uh, I just wanted to mention the spike of sharp waves, um, something that people that do diagnostic EEG see a lot of. Um, there's no distinction from our perspective uh, between these two patterns from, our, from use in the operating room. They have no ideological or prognostic significance. They, you don't have to overinterpret them or worry about them. Uh, you just need to be aware when you see a spike or you see a sharp wave that you're seeing. We treat them the same. Electrocorticography, I just wanted to mention that because um, as, as we talked about the EGs from the surface of the scalp, the corticography is from the surface of the brain. Um, so what are the differences? Well, if you, if you think about what you're looking at the data through, you know, you've got to get to the scalp EEG, you've got to get through the CSF, the meninges, the bone and the muscle, the skin. So you've got, uh, in, in what, from an electrical perspective, is a big filter. It's, it's a big uh, high-pass filter, uh, or maybe low-pass filter. So uh, things that are higher frequencies are filtered out. They're just not there. And it's a big attenuator you're going to lose a lot of your signal strength going through all that tissue. So you can look at the corticography data and it will be, A, be a lot bigger. So um, I think the scaling on this is... This is 600 microvolts per division if I put the divisions up. So, uh, but typically, if we were looking at the scalp, we'd have the sensitivity at like 100 microvolts per division. So it's, it's a lot bigger because you don't have the effect of all these, think of them as resistors and capacitors between you and the source. You're right at the source. And the waves are a lot sharper. So you don't have this effect of 
of the tissue filtering everything out. So uh, you expect to see better, well, well, far better defined waves, and you expect to see larger waves. Uh -huh. Uh, let's see what the name is. Okay. So summary, so this was just meant to uh, review how the EEG is generated, talk about the major classes, essentials of frequency domain analysis, effects of anesthesia, and effects of ischemia and hypothermia on the EEG. Uh, I tried to, I went through it pretty quickly because uh, it sounds like almost everybody's an EEG here, so. Uh, and I'm sure everybody has their their own thoughts about how you get EGs and what you do and you know, all that kind of stuff. And my my partner is a is a uh, classically trained electroencephalographer, and so we discuss all the time uh, how many channels of data should you record. You know, uh, and and I I tend to favor fewer rather than more. She tends to favor more rather than fewer, our results are the same. So I think it's what you're comfortable with. Understand the data. Are we 